70 years ago tomorrow, the New York Yankees made sure that no one would ever again wear number three in pinstripes. They retired Babe Ruth's number, and in doing so, continued to create a, a magic around one of the most mythical figures in all of sports. The Bambino also had plenty of Canadian connections in his fabled past, and author Jerry Amernick chronicles that and more in Babe Ruth, A Superstar's Legacy. And Jerry, we are delighted to welcome you to TVO for this book. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. Before we get to the Canadian connections, which clearly was a, a real point of interest in this book, yes. I, I, I don't want to assume that everybody knows everything about the Babe, so let's, let's go tell the story. Where was he born? He was born in Baltimore, 1895. What 1895. What was his childhood like? He had a childhood that you could take out of a Dickens novel. Um, he, uh, he, they say he was a man in search of his childhood throughout his life. So he didn't have a very uh, amenable family situation. Uh, when he was seven, his parents put him in St. Mary's Industrial School for boys. Now, many people have said that it's an orphanage. It's not, but it was a, an industrial school, and uh, he really grew up there. But prior to that, you know, his father ran a saloon, and, you know, the longshoremen and uh, any type of different types of characters, that's who he grew up with. So, like I say, it was like a Dickensian Mm -hmm. Childhood, so and it was apparently some Canadian taught him how to play baseball back at there. Yeah, there's there's a lot of Canadian connections to Babe Ruth, which is you know maybe the most mythical figure in American history. You could even argue that, but a lot of Canadian connections. The man who taught Babe Ruth to play baseball, Brother Matthias, who was at St. Mary's Industrial School for Boys, was in fact born in Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. How about that? And he's the guy who taught Babe Ruth how to pitch, how to hit, and so that's that's quite quite something. That is pretty cool. Uh, of course we know him as Babe Ruth. His real name is George Herman Ruth. But yes. How did he get Babe as a nickname? Well, when he was in the minor leagues, uh, the manager, uh, Dunn, uh, he was called one of, uh, one of his babes. So the name stuck. And uh, uh, even before he became famous, he was known as Babe Ruth. Hmm. He was, of course, known for slugging more home runs than anybody else at his time. And yes. had the all-time, you know, home run uh, career number for a very long time yes. until Henry Aaron came along. What people may not know is he was a fantastic pitcher as well when he was with the Boston Red Sox at the beginning of his career. Absolutely. I mean, the first few years of his career, he was a pitcher, and he, in fact, was the best left-handed pitcher in the American League. Hmm. He set a, a, a record in the World Series, I think 29 scoreless innings that lasted until the 60s. But here's a guy who would have made the Hall of Fame as a pitcher. I mean, think about that. <laughs> and he would have. Mm -hmm. uh, so they talk about Shohei Otani, the Japanese player, who's now, they're saying, the second coming of Babe Ruth. Plays for I the mean, Angels. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, he's quite a remarkable ball player, but I think it's a little early to say he's the second coming of Ruth. Well, he's not hitting 60 home runs a year, that's for darn sure. Not yet. <laughs> not yet, right. Okay, so the Babe is a big name in Boston. He's a young, up-and-coming player. And then the Red Sox make the trade from Boston to New York, yes. which curses the Red Sox for the next 86 years Absolutely. and turns the Babe into a household name. How did that trade happen? Well, it was 1920. Uh, the owner of the Red Sox uh, ran these shows in New York and needed some money. And, you know, a uh, ball player, like today, was really uh, an item of uh, merchandise, of value. And they Ruth was already the biggest name in baseball. Because his last year in Boston, he set the record for home runs, which at the time was 29. And he was out homering teams, you know, in those days. Mm -hmm. So he came to New York, and, and I think a legend was created. And I, I call it, uh, other, I, I can t I'm going to claim this, but other people have said it too, it was the perfect storm. You had the dawn of the Roaring Twenties. Mm -hmm. You had New York City, and you had this character, Babe Ruth, was just an incredible character, almost a mythological character in real life. And those things all came together and created the legend of Babe Ruth. Well, let's add one more thing to the list, because you say it was 1920. Yeah. Remind everybody what happened in 1919. Well, the Black Sox scandal. Uh, it was uh, the Chicago White Sox through the World Series. And, you know, ballplayers in those days were not paid very well. Mm -hmm. Ruth was paid well, but most of them weren't paid very well at all. So they threw the World Series. Um, in fact, they can make more money losing th th than mm -hmm. winning. So. Uh, eight s players were suspended for life, including Shulis Joe Jackson, whom Babe Ruth knew. And uh, so uh, baseball was at its absolute bottom. So it needed a good news story. It needed a and good news story, Ruth. and Ruth was a story with his home runs. There's a Canadian connection with the trade from Boston to New York as well, right? Yeah, the Royal Bank of Canada actually issued a bond through its New York agency. Uh, I believe it was for $300,000. And it's funny, you know, because when I was researching this, we're going back years now, I heard something about this, and I called their headquarters, which is in Montreal, talked to 
a young lady on the phone and mentioned what it was about. And I remember because she was laughing when I mentioned this, like laughing on the phone, oh, really? And then when she called me back later, she wasn't laughing. Yes, it's true. It's true. So <laughs> the Royal Bank of Canada was involved. They called the old Yankee Stadium the house that Ruth built. Yes. How come? Well, it went up in 1923. Uh, his first year with the Yankees, 1920, he hit, uh, what, 54 homers, which was a, a number that was unheard of. The next year, 59 homers. And like I say, he was out homering teams, mm. not just other players. So the Yankees were playing at the Polo Grounds. Uh, uh, which is where the Giants played. Where the Giants played. And they were basically like tenants renting. Mm. And with Ruth, they were draw out drawing, you know, the Giants and everybody else. So they didn't want them around anymore. So they built their own stadium. So they call it the house that Ruth built. Who hit the first home run in Yankee Stadium? Babe Ruth. I don't even have to ask. We know yeah. that. And that, that bat sold at auction, I believe, for $1.3 million. And it was a deal at that price. <laughs> Babe, you know, if you read the book, you know, Babe Ruth, I think, is a better investment than gold. We'll I get mean. to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> so. At one point, Babe Ruth signed a contract that paid him more than President Herbert Hoover. Yes. Uh, they asked Babe, do you feel somewhat embarrassed about that? What right. was his answer? Well, it was a great answer. They said, you make more than the president. He said, well, I had a better year. So, I mean, <laughs> you couldn't really have made a better reply than that. <laughs> the, the conventional wisdom on Babe is that as much as he was a superstar on the field, he caroused, he womanized, he drank to excess, he ate to excess off the field. Yeah. Now, you've looked into this, and what's your conclusion? Well, um, he's been called in some circles an alcoholic. That wasn't the case. Many ballplayers obviously did have a drinking problem, especially in those days. He wasn't an alcoholic. Um, he, before he married his second wife, Claire, who really straightened him out, uh, yeah, he was kind of a wild guy. Uh, which was not really unusual for ball players, you know. I mean, there's wild ball players today too. Um, so there is this wild, rabble-rousing side of Babe Ruth, which is true. But the other side of Ruth, and everybody I've talked to for 25 years now who knew him, or knew player, or knew others who knew him, said what a wonderful human being he was, with a heart of gold. And it sounds, you know, it's almost uh, stereotypical to say something, you know, that heart of gold, but it really did apply to this guy because everybody I've talked to says the same thing. Jerry, his daughter is still alive, right? Julia, yes. She's going to be 102 next month. Huh. Yeah. Okay. 102 in July. Her yeah. name is Julia Ruth Stevens. Yes. And there's a story here because she's not his biological daughter. How, do, how did she come to be his daughter? Well, um, Babe Ruth, uh, his second wife was Claire Hodgson. Uh, Julia was Claire's daughter. From a previous? Yes. Now, uh, Claire really took up with Babe Ruth around 1922-23, but they didn't get married until 1929. So Babe Ruth came into Julia's life when she was about six. And frankly, she, uh, he was the only father that she ever knew. When she got married, he gave her away, and, and they were very, very close, and she's the last surviving member of the Ruth household. Did he formally adopt her? Yes, he did. He did. He did adopt her, yes. And, but, but having said that, there are no kind of blood relatives of Babe Ruth left, I guess, then. Is that right? Well, there are stories about that. There may or may not be. Another side of the Ruth family claims that there is. So, But I was dealing with Julia, and especially her son, Tom Stevens, the grandson of Babe Ruth. He wrote the foreword to the book mm -hmm. and has been a huge help to me, actually, in, in doing this book as well. Tom Stevens. Yes. Yeah. After his playing days were over, he was, of course, this legendary figure. When he retired from baseball, he had the all-time home run record. Yeah. He wanted to manage, as a lot of ex-ball players do. They want yes. to get a job as a manager. Yes. He never got one. Yeah. How come? Well, there's quite a story there. And I think it might be one of the most powerful stories in the, you know, the legend of Babe Ruth. And it was Julia who first told me about this. I spent an afternoon with her at her home. She had a home in New Hampshire. And uh, she told me that, uh, well, he would have hired or would have advocated the hiring of black ball players if he had been a manager. Tom said the same thing. Um, and this was news to me. Now, he died in 1948. The color bar was broken in 1947. He died 70 years ago this August. Yeah, 1948. So Jackie uh, Robinson, 1947. So the story goes that, um, and I, I talked to an author named Bill Jenkinson, who's a baseball historian, researcher, and he's probably researched this more than anybody. And he says the reason Ruth never was hired as a manager was because, number one, he would have advocated hiring black ball players, which was a no-no in those days. Mm -hmm. And also, number two, he would have asked players to ask for more money, 
would have advised them. And Julia told me this wonderful story about Lou Gehrig. And, and Julia, when I saw her, she was a spry, I don't know, 93 or 94. It was a few years ago. But I spent an afternoon with her, which was a remarkable afternoon and as sharp as a tack. And she told me this great story about Lou Gehrig, whom she knew very well. His Yankee teammate. Yeah, yeah, uh, Lou Gehrig. And uh, she said Lou, uh, his contract was coming up, and he was making maybe fifteen or $18,000 a year, something like that. And he asked Babe if he should ask the Colonel, Colonel Rupert, the owner, for a raise. I mean, this is how players, what they were like in those mm -hmm. days. So uh, Babe Ruth said, yes, ask for a raise. And how much? He said, well, ask for 40000 which was more than twice what he was making. And he said, that much? And Julia then said, because uh, well, she was witness to all this, that uh, Babe said, well, you may have to come down a little bit, but make it difficult for the colonel. So here's a guy who had, you know, a grade seven, grade eight education, but he knew his worth as a ball player. Mm -hmm. uh, he made, uh, his highest salary was 80000 And he made, of course, with endorsements, he made a lot more than that. So here's a guy, really with no education, very rough around the edges, very much a people person, as, as the book goes into, but he knew his worth, and he wasn't made a fool of by the owners. Uh, still in all, if he made 80 grand back then, yeah. that's not the equivalent of what ballplayers make no, today. No, it's maybe a little over a million dollars a year. And, and the best pitchers and ballplayers today can make 30 million a year. Oh, it, there's no comparison. So even, you know, yeah. even allowing for the fact that he was the highest paid player of yes. his day, still dramatically under uh, market value. Well, compared to today. Compared one to one today. of the agents uh, who, I, I, who was actually quoted in the book uh, was asked what his worth would be today. And I believe the figure he gave was something like a uh, 10-year or $250 million contract, maybe more. Over, you know. over 10 years? Um, He'd do be better than that. Actually, it was even less than 10 years okay. but, uh, upon signing. But he said mm -hmm. he wasn't just the, fran uh, you know, the mainstay of the franchise. He was the franchise. You talked a moment ago about the fact that um, investing in the babe is better mm -hmm. than investing in the stock market or gold. And yeah. let's just give some examples here. Yeah. His jersey. A Babe Ruth worn jersey sold six years ago for $4.4 .4 million. Guinness World Record. <laughs> Charlie Sheen bought and sold some of his stuff too, right? The actor yeah. Charlie Sheen? Yes, he did. He bought the, he's, he, the contract selling him to the Yankees, he bought for $150K, sold it for $2.3 million. His 1927 World Series ring, Charlie paid $225,000, sold it for over $2 million. Yeah. What is it about the babe that his stuff is just solid gold? Well, you know, um, there's uh, two chapters in the book that get into the sports collectibles industry in a big way. And one of them is, is about that particular jersey. And as one of the players, uh, one of the executives in the industry said to me, there are two categories. There's Babe Ruth and there's everyone else. Hmm. So he really sets a standard for everything. Uh, the jersey you mentioned that sold that auction in uh, 2012 for $4.4 million. Hmm. The jersey who wore a 1920, 1921 season. So that was an auction, and I did a whole chapter about the auction, how it works. And, and obviously, these are high rollers that get involved in this yep. sort of thing. So I actually spoke to the guy who bought the jersey, but he bought it as an agent for his client, and he's not going to reveal the name of the client. So um, back in 2012, uh, they paid $4.4 million for the, that's U.S., of course, hmm. for the jersey. Um, I spoke to him when I was working on the book last year. This is 2017, so five years later. How much would that jersey be worth today? He said, you'll never know until you put it up for auction, but he suspects it would fetch more than $10 million. Unbelievable. How about that? And David Wells, the former Blue Jay and Yankee pitcher, yes. did what? He wore, uh, well, he was a, a Ruth uh, nut. Yeah. I think he had a tattoo on his arm, and, and he had a cap that Ruth wore. Uh, he bought it as a collector, yeah. and he actually wore it in a league game <laughs> where he got fined by the manager for that. That's Boomer. Okay, yeah. Yeah. let's get to the Canadian connections here. Yeah. Babe Ruth hit his first professional home run where? Well, a, a lot of people, cities are going to vie for this. So he hit his first professional home run in an official league game in Canada, in Toronto, at the old ballpark at Hamlet's Point. Playing for what team? Providence uh, Grace. So he's a minor leaguer. He's a minor professional, leaguer. but he's a minor leaguer. Yeah, it's one level below the majors, okay. and they were playing the Toronto Maple Leaf baseball team, and it was the only home run he hit that it's, year. It's 104 years ago. Yeah. And he was pitching against the Toronto Maple Leafs, which is not the hockey team. Yeah. There was a baseball team <laughs> right. called the Toronto Maple right. Leafs. Where is that ball? Well, um, you know, my research into Babe Ruth started with a novel I wrote. It was my first novel back in 2004 called Gift of the Bambino. And the story, it's about a boy and his grandfather in baseball. And it starts with that home run uh, in 1914, September 5th, 1914. It was three weeks after World War I broke out. There's a lot of stories, legends about what happened to the ball. 
So in my story, and I believe the ball went into the lake. It was right where the Billy Bishop Airport is now mm -hmm. in that area. Uh, so my whole novel is built around the ball going into the lake. Now there are other people that say, no, someone caught it, and there's all kinds of stories about what happened to that ball. Well, here's another one, because he did play an exhibition game for the Yankees against the AAA Toronto Maple yes. Leaf baseball team yeah. at the old Maple Leaf Stadium, which was at the foot of Bathurst Street That's in right. Toronto back yes. in the day. Where's that ball? Well, that ball apparently went into the lake as well. <laughs> and, and We uh, got to drain the lake. It, well, uh, it was Tom Volk, who was the head of the Canadian uh, Baseball Hall of Fame, who told me that once. We, I did a story on that years ago, and uh, he said we should drain the lake if two of the babe's taters are sitting at the bottom. So <laughs> that was a great quote. I mean, those balls would be, uh, you know, even though I'm sure they're, they're decrepit, but something must be preserved down there. Yeah, and the value, you know, yeah. there is a ball signed by Babe Ruth. I thought it was from the 1927 season. Someone said actually it was another season. That one ball signed by Babe Ruth sold for $388,000. <laughs> and, and the way it works in the industry, too, if, if there's a ball signed by Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, it's devalued from a single signature of Babe Ruth. So, like, he set the standard hmm. with everything, and the, the monies that are paid are, are incredible. Tell us how. We mentioned earlier that it'll be 70 years this August that the babe died. Yeah. Very young man, right? He was 53? 53, yes. How did he die? Well, he had uh, throat cancer, uh, though mm. it was never revealed to him what he died of, or revealed to him what he died of. Mm. And, uh, but the last two years of his life, he was really suffering. He gave a very famous, they had a day for him, right, at Yankee Stadium? It was at all the ballparks, but it was at Yankee Stadium, and they had every park in Major League Baseball had Babe Ruth Day, yeah. And he'd get up to the microphone and he'd give a speech, and yeah. you could hear it, right? Yeah, a very hoarse voice, and he was very gaunt, and uh, obviously was in very failing health at that time. Because when he played, he was... Larger than life, right? He's a big guy. Well, you know, the Babe Ruth movies, you know, John Goodman mm -hmm. and uh, earlier than that, William Bendix. I mean, I use the analogy, it's like getting uh, Woody Allen to play Muhammad Ali. When Ruth <laughs> came up to the majors, he was 6'2", 215. And for that time, that was a giant, by the way. Mm -hmm. And he was a pitcher. And uh, so he was slim. So he wasn't this big pork barrel guy that he's often depicted as. Mm -hmm. uh, though later in his life, he did you know, obviously get larger. But he still kept hitting home runs. As we look at the Jumbotron here in our makeshift baseball stadium here, yeah. how, how old would he be there? I saw that photograph, Steve, last year, and I had never seen the photo before. Uh, mm -hmm. It was taken in 1920, his first season with the Yankees, so he would have been 25. It was taken in the dugout, and it was a photograph. And he looks like a pretty powerful guy who can hit 714 home runs. <laughs> the thing about the photo, though, is uh, it was a single photograph that he signed and it was in a nice wooden frame, and it was a large photo, and there's only the one. That photograph sold at auction, I think it was 2004 around then, sold at auction for $150,000. <laughs> it was the first, what they call in the category, single signed photograph of anything that had ever fetched more than $100,000. And the guy who bought it gave us permission to use it on the cover. Nice. Yeah. Jerry, 100 years later, he's still the biggest name in baseball. Yes. Ever. Yeah. Why? Well, I think it goes back to the character that he was. He's, he's a guy who, um, he loved the fans, loved kids. Um, I, I tell the story that uh, one day last summer, I went to the Giamatti Research Library at Cooperstown, which is the biggest a collection of baseball data, history anywhere in the world. It's quite remarkable. I had an appointment there, and they went through, I went through all the Babe Ruth scrapbooks. They have a scrapbook about the old Negro Leagues. They have a scrapbook about women's baseball, one about Latino baseball. 25 scrapbooks on Babe Ruth. <laughs> so I went through them, and it was remarkable. And the, I mean, you see the stories. You see how the, the media covered him. We have reporters today who cover uh, baseball, or who may, they may cover a team. In those days, they had reporters. Their beat was Babe Ruth, <laughs> you know? And he gave them a lot to cover. But the thing is, uh, so you see all the stories, and how everything he did was uh, in the press. I mean, it was unbelievable how much, uh, to, to what degree. But the thing that struck me are the photographs of visiting orphanages, uh, kids, uh, disabled kids. Uh, and, and these kids are all, in all ethnic groups, all mm. you know, colors, all backgrounds. And uh, it's, it's one after the other after the other. And, and while it's known that he, that he did these visits, um, the family told me that for every visit that you know was mentioned in the media, there were maybe 50 others that weren't. Right. Uh, so he he was was quite a guy that way. Larger than life. Yes. We are down to our last 30 seconds here, and I don't want us to get off the air before we point out that you're going to be at Cooperstown, New York, 
for Hall of Fame weekend. That's July 26th. Yeah. So if anybody's going to go down for the Hall of Fame swearing in, yeah. they can find you there with the book. And yeah. you've got a website, baberuthlegacy.com, yes. in which there are interviews and much more information yes. about the Bambino. What's your favorite nickname for him? Uh, what's my favorite nickname for him? Well, there are so many, but I'll tell you my favorite quote that he gave. Go ahead. Watch my dust. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing that for 100 years. Yeah. Uh, that's a book about the Sultan of Swat, which is my favorite nickname for yeah. him. Babe Ruth, A Superstar's Legacy. Jerry Amernick. Uh, so nice of you to come visit us at TVO tonight, Jerry. Thanks so much. Thank you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.